Rothko um, is a pretty ubiquitous character. Uh, many people know and love his work from what they can see of it. There's a, there's a very substantial artist and, and really interesting um, to see what he was, he was after. Um, and let's see, I'm gonna go right here and start with a little uh, excerpt from a lecture that he did at, I believe it, at, it was at Pratt. Um, and uh, recipe of a work of art, its ingredients, how to make it, the formula. <laughs> the guy had quite a sense of humor. Number one, there must be a clear preoccupation with death, <laughs> intimations of mortality, tragic art, romantic art, etc., deals with the knowledge of death. Number two, sensuality. Our basis of being concrete about the world. It is a lustful relationship with things that exist. Number three, tension, either conflict or curbed desire. Number four, irony. This is a modern ingredient the self-effacement and examination by which man for an instant can go on to something else. Number five, wit and play for the human element. <laughs> Number six, the ephemeral and chance for the human element again. Uh, Number seven, hope, 10% to make the tragic concept more adorable. <laughs> I measure these ingredients very carefully when I paint a picture. It is always the form that follows these elements. And the picture results from the proportions of these elements. So this painting that I chose to put next to this is, is um, pretty far into his career. It's, it's, it's really more or less, I'd say, uh, a good 20 years into, into his career before he has hit this place where he's really found his voice and is speaking through this work. Um, beautiful piece. Okay, um, so as an art student, let, let me go back, let me go back a couple of steps and I'll, I'll do the background stuff. I'll do, you know, basically um, he's an immigrant. Uh, the family immigrated from Latvia um, and basically um, he was born in, um, uh, God, where is it? 1903, I believe it is. Um, and uh, okay, and died in uh, 1970. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, his family uh, basically he was he was um, um, Jewish, but not practicing Jewish. They were they were uh, they they really valued education. So um, his father was a pharmacist in Latvia. Um, in uh, when let's see, I believe Rothko was ten when they immigrated from. Latvia, which was still part of Russia at that time, to the United States. Um, his father saw to it that that um, Mark went to um, a uh, studied the Talmud. 
So he was he was educated, um, very precocious. Uh, when they came to the United States, they went immediately out to Portland, Oregon, where um, uh, his father's brother had immigrated. So uh, his father being a pharmacist set up a pharmacy out there, but unfortunately the father died within a year of moving to the United States. Um, Mark was very bright, as I said, very precocious. He, he, he actually um, won a scholarship to Yale University and, and went. Um, in the 20s, uh, basically, it was not all he hoped for. It was definitely, he spent, he was there for two years and dropped out um, because he found the anti-Semitism that was still in, in play, even in a place of higher learning like Yale, was just more than he wanted to bear. Uh, so he moved to New York City and began interest in, in, in art. Um, started taking classes at, um, at the uh, Art Students League. And actually he started taking a class with um, the abstract artist, um, uh, Arshel Gorky, but didn't like Gorky much. Uh, so he moved over to um, uh, Max Weber's class, who was a European immigre also, um, was very knowledgeable about Cubism and um, uh, German Expressionism. So he really introduced Rothko to those um, uh, kind of schools of thought from Europe. Um, Rothko met and became very close friends with uh, Milton Avery. And down below you see a portrait by Milton Avery of Rothko with pipe. Um, this is a self portrait off to the upper upper left. And you know, um, they're very expressionistic paintings. It was it was, you know, really kind of in in vogue at the time. Um, uh, I think he was he was searching for himself and it took him a good long time to find the direction he wanted to go in. Um, he, in 1929, took a job teaching um, at a, um, a Jewish Y or synagogue. I'm not, I'm not exactly clear about that at this stage, but, um, but, you can see these these watercolors that that are here were done on construction paper. He was very much into encouraging his students to just try things. Um, so I am going to move along here. Okay, here we have again uh, um, Milton Avery on the bottom right, Coney Island, and Rothko also Coney Island. They probably were there together. Um, Rothko became friends with um, uh, Adolf Gottlieb, who was another um, uh, person who also befriended, um, was befriended by Milton Avery. Milton Avery was a very important character to these guys. He, uh, he embodied what it was to be an artist and to make a living or to commit yourself to being a full-time professional artist. So they, they really felt that he was a mentor and they, they you know, remained friends, the three of them, um, through just about throughout their entire lives. Um, And these are um, Avery's, I mean, uh, excuse me, yeah, Avery's. Uh, you can see the Avery influence here in these subway pieces, but these are um, uh, Rothko's pieces from the, from the late thirties, where he began to do the sequence of pieces on the subways. There's a very kind of 
surrealist atmosphere in these pieces, um, the sense of isolation. And I put up a Giacometti along with it to show you that kind of attenuated figure and that sense of anxiety that permeated the world at that time. I mean, look at where we are, 37, 38, 39. This is entering into World War II. There's, there's you know, great upheaval in the world. If you look really closely though at these things and look at them as geometric shapes, you can see already the, the formative elements that become Rothko's work later on in his career. Um, there's a sen the sense of anxiety and alienation and all of that in the, in the figurative works, but the abstract backgrounds, if you kind of eliminate the, them as figures and just look at them as shapes, these are already, already have that, that um, rectangular abstract element. Okay, and as the war came, the 1940s, there were a lot of immigrants to the United States. Many of the surrealists came to the United States. Max Ernst was in New York. Um, um, you can see his work on the lower left, um, excuse me, lower right. Um, this is, you know, a powerful influence and, and Rothko not being really satisfied with the figurative work that he was doing takes, takes this on. And, and basically it's a shift to mythological and surrealistic elements in, in, in his work. Um, it's really, you know, Paul Clay, uh, Max Ernst, um, a number of the, the surrealists come, in, come into it with, with this. Um, if you look at, let's see, oh, okay. Um, if you look at the omen of the eagle, um, there's this militaristic, this conflict that's going on throughout the world. You know, the, the eagle is a symbol of the United States and the military and the, that, whole, that whole dynamic. These, these are kind of dreamlike images that, that kind of evoke that, that um, atmosphere. Okay. So, you know, Freud and Jung um, figure into these dreamlike pieces this kind of free association, allowing the, the, you know, the distortions, the, the kind of organic um, material to be pulled and stretched in, in you know, you can imagine um, the, the ideas that, that Dali was playing with, you know, the kind of stretching and pulling and, and attenuating of, of internal organs and all of that. Below is uh, Arshel Gorky from 1948. And you can see where there's, there's a certain kind of, of um, thematic imagery that's being, that's being um, played with at that time. And, and let's see. Okay, um, so one of the most important um, philosophical grounds for, for um, uh, Rothko's work was Nietzsche's birth of tragedy um, and what he was talking about was these kind of opposing forces inside of us, the kind of um, um, urge to order and 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 wish to merge with 
with the universe, this sense of, 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 of dread and wonder at the same time. Um, so this does enter into his thinking about how he's approaching his work. Ah, this is, this is a, you know, mature, fairly developed Adolf Gottlieb piece on, on the, on the left. And you can see how, you know, they're really playing with these pictograms and, and trying to deal with the mythological elements that, that um, really kind of um, underpin the work. Um, on, on the right is Paul Clay. Clay, again, was one that Rothko looked at long and hard and really took in the, the play with the unconscious, the business of allowing um, this kind of childlike openness to dream. To, to allow imagery to evolve and, and um, you know, this is, this is the year that one of the final paintings uh, that, that Paul Clay painted. Uh, so there's this skull-like figure in the center. Okay. In, you know, post-war, um, the, um, Rothko moved on past the surrealist business into th these multi-forms, um, and he interacted with Clifford Still, um, actually, he had a show at the San Francisco Museum of, Fine of uh, Modern Art that Clifford Still helped set up. Um, Clifford Still, the painter on the, on the right, was, was um, teaching, he was head of the, what is now the San Francisco Art Institute, it was California School of the Arts or something like that back then. And um, he invited Rothko in 1947 and 1949 to come and act as a, a guest artist. Um, so Rothko really continued to be a bi-coastal artist. He, you know, went out to Portland when, when, you know, with his family. So he grew up in Portland. Um, so he would shift back and forth between New York and California, um, teaching in various places. He actually taught in Colorado. He taught a number of different places for periods of time. Um, but by the late 40s, he was starting to get some real recognition and starting to basically, one of the things that he did was he had been showing with Betty Parsons in New York, which is a really reputable gallery. Um, and he set up a show for Clifford Still with Betty Parsons. Let's see, moving along here. Um, Okay, I'm gonna give you a few pieces from this transitional multi-form period. Um, he was very influenced by Clifford Still. They, they were you know, in sync with each other about abstraction. Um, uh, Clifford Still used to talk about people like Jackson Pollock and, 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 uh, and de Kooning as those scribblers on the East Coast. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's a certain kind of affinity that, that, that what, what Rothko was after was something more solid and more substantial and more subdued in, in many ways. So these multi-forms, these are, you know, getting to a more mature point He's, he's experimenting with this. He doesn't stay with these for very long. Um, it's, it's really a matter of three or four years that he's working through these multi-form images. 
but he's trying different things. He's starting to experiment with, with, um, with veils of color and, and layering and, and um, allowing the underpainting to kind of emerge and submerge in various places. There's gesture, which is still very close to the surface, which, which remains as part of the underlying practice that he uses throughout his, his, his more mature work, but they're much more subdued and less obvious than they are here. So, you know, oil and mixed media, you know, you can see in this piece where there's kind of this veil that's painted over that yellow hover in the top and it, it's kind of brought back out again on the surface. You know, there's there's an orange that's underneath the 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 white veil that's in the upper left hand corner. You can see these forms kind of emerge and submerge below these veils of color. Okay, in 1949, he experienced this. Red Studio, which is now on exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art. And I'm going to talk more about that. We're going to actually do a whole talk on Matisse later on next month. Um, and basically, there is a show that's coming um, in um, next, actually next fall, to um, uh, the Philadelphia Museum, uh, Matisse from the 30s. So I am going to be addressing Matisse quite a bit in, in that time. But what I wanted to talk about with this is how this affected Rothko. Rothko had a studio around the corner, actually up the street from the Museum of Modern Art at this time. He was living on 50, I think 53rd. And, and he would go on a weekly basis, maybe more, to go and see this painting because it was just bought and put on view in 1949. Um, I'm gonna zoom in on this thing for a minute so that, so that you can see a couple of things that I wanna point out. Let's see, all right, right here. So if you see that grandfather clock that's dead center in the composition, I mean, dead center in that composition, Notice that there are no hands on the clock. It is a timeless space. It's a color space. It's something that hovers in a different zone, in a different dimension. And this is something that Rothko was really picking up on and tuning into. Um, the, the mark making, the, the um, The, the indications of per, traditional perspective are kind of these negative spaces, these lines that are left unpainted with the kind of background showing through them. Um, let's see if I can get even, I can't get much closer than I am unfortunately with the, with the zoom. This is about the best we can do. But take my word for it, there's underpainting underneath this red of various colors, and they show through in different areas in that line that he left unpainted to indicate the, the objects in the room and to give you some idea of, of, of where you are spatially. He also invites us into the space. He invites us into this creative space. Matisse leaves a little message for us on this table in the foreground. There's crayons there ready for us to make our own drawing and enter into the space with him. Um, so Rothko would have picked up on all of this on some level. Um, and this painting was painted in that period of time. Rothko described this composition as the elimination of all obstacles between the painter and the idea, and between the idea 
and the observer. So you can see those scratched in lines and, and the, the reference there to, to this Matisse is pretty obvious to me. Uh, okay. All right. So um, these pieces actually, this is quite a large piece. If you look at the size of the piece, it's nine foot nine inches by eight feet and 11 inches. That's a big piece. It's bigger than the Red Studio. Well, I got a lot of ground to cover. <laughs> um, so one of the things I wanted to talk about a little bit is this pigmented hide glue. What, what Rothko would do was he, he would, this is a very common practice among the old masters. They would coat their canvases with rabbit skin glue or hide glue before they would paint on them. They would heat it and they would paint that on, and then they would paint over that with a, with a white lead ground color. What Rothko did was mix pigment in with that hide glue. So there would be a color over that entire surface. And then he would paint into it with the oil paint. And he would do that with, with different thicknesses of, of of paint, he would use uh, turpentine and let the paint soak into the canvas. Um, let me see if I can zoom into this too, so you can get a view of this. Um, one of the things that I wanted to point out here is if you look at this green that's underneath and you see a little edge of it showing between the, that indigo mass and the, and the burgundy above it. Um, it's kind of like he painted over that, that green, but let it, let it show through to some degree. He would use these very big brushes and, and put that paint on very you know, softly and allow the brushwork to show. Um, okay. By 1950, Rothko had reduced the number of floating rectangles to two, three, or four, and aligned them vertically against a color ground, arriving at his signature style. From that time on, he would work almost invariably within this format, suggesting numerous variations in color and tone, an astonishing range of atmospheres and moods. Um, there's just an incredible hovering resonance to these pieces. Now applied in thin washes, often composed of both oil and egg-based media. He was trying all kinds of stuff. Uh, Rothko uh, Rothko's color achieved a new luminosity. The artist's technique appears simple, but on close examination, is a richly varied is richly richly varied in its range of effects. At times, painting the painting can the paint can seem to seem to be running across the surface. Um, Rothko would invert the paintings. He would shift them around and then, and then um, sometimes change the final orientation. If I can zoom in a little, well, actually I don't need to zoom in on this one because I have this to show you. And so you can see the quality of the brush mark, the scra scraping and striations and, the the depth and richness of the paint and what's underneath and what's over the top and it you know he's he's playing back and forth that white 
kind of brushwork that's pulled up and then covered over again. Um, I'm going to go back to this. And you can see in this area in the center on the, on the left where this close-up is coming from. So he would allow the, the paint to soak into the canvas. He would allow the turpentine to soak in. One of the advantages to using the rabbit skin glue, the high glue, is it would seal the, the canvas on both sides so that even, even if he allowed the, the turpentine and the paint to soak all the way through the canvas, it wouldn't rot the canvas, which is something which basically um, oil paint will do. It will, it will deteriorate with time. Um, Rothko described the concept of a painting in which shapes or performers first emerge as an unknown adventure in an unknown space. In the, the journal, possibilities. He explained that these shapes have no direct association with any particular visible experience, but in them one recognizes the principle and passion of organisms. He later wrote, art to me is an antidote, antecedent of the spirit and the only means of making concrete the purpose of its varied quickness and stillness. He's after trying to capture the state of, of, of mind, of, of, our, of our inner recesses. Um, these paintings are performers. We are interacting with them. They're not about something outside. They're an experience that we have. Once asked um, how close he should, uh, people should view his, his work, he said 18 inches. In other words, he wants you to be inside the painting. When you're 18 inches from one of these giant paintings, your peripheral vision is filled with them. So this is part of what he's after. He's after enveloping us in these paintings. Through his pursuit of a deeply original pictorial language, Rothko maintained a commitment to profound content Although he rarely specified a precise interpretation for these works, he believed in their potential for metaphysical or symbolic meaning. In a lecture at Pratt Institute, Rothko told the audience that small pictures since the Renaissance are like novels. Large pictures are like dramas in which one participates in a direct way. And here we have Caspar David Friedrich, who is, it was basically a, a fore, forebearer or forefather of this sense of the, the tragic, of the sense of the sublime, of the awe before this, this, this majestic experience of, 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 well, you know, he would, he would put it as God, um, Rothko would not label it that. Um, below, I have a, 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 a piece by Turner. And Turner, again, is one who, you know, was really into trying to um, bring the forces of nature into, into our lives, to actually experience them directly, to try and take in that, 
sense, well, there's a word for it, which is called the sublime. Um, and the definition of the sublime, I got it right here, is, is um, to elevate, to exalt, to um, render finer as purity or excellence, to convert into something of higher worth. Um, lofty, grand, exalted, spiritual, intellectual, moral worth. Um, so, um, you know, Turner used to, Turner once had himself strapped to a mast in a storm to try and experience the full force of, of this thing. He almost drowned. Um, so, so one of the things that, that Rothko is trying to get to is this sense of the sublime, of the awesome, of the terrifying, of the, of the tragic and, and ex exaltation, this kind of reverie um, in the face of nature, in the face of our, our, our being. So where these edges meet, these soft edges, that there's, there's a kind of transitional space um, and, and this kind of smoky, vaporous quality is something that Rothko really developed in these pieces. I have to check my time. Let's see. Okay. I got to speed this up. I've got a lot more room to move through. Just lovely color and, and incredible. Okay. Um, these are mature pieces from Adolf Gottlieb and Barnett Newman, both close friends of, of Rothko. Um, and he, he would actually, um, they had very different approaches to this thing called, that they labeled color field painting. You know, Rothko was always after this 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 sense of the of the of the human presence of the 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 hand. Gottlieb again was one you know definitely for the 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 gesture of the human presence. Um, Newman, not as much momentary glimpses of of the fact that 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 someone painted that 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 edge on there but um but they were really into creating color spaces in in very particular ways um the saturated color of the Amish quilts something that that Rothko really admired he really you know, you can see the relationship, the resonant color um, in in both of these images. Uh, so, in you know, in the fifties and sixties, Rothko would have been aware of these these quilts. They, you know, they were they were part of what he was looking at and experiencing. Okay, we're now moving along to. Um, the Seagram's um, story, which is quite the story. Actually, he got this big commission in 1958, 59. Now, by this time, Rothko was very successful. He had museum shows at um, the Phillips. He had, um, had been in, um, let's see, um, he had, 
several, yeah, he had a one-man show at the Phillips. Um, he had a number of different shows uh, throughout Europe um, and Chicago. Um, he'd been all over the place and his work was selling very well at this point. Um, he, was, he was commissioned by Philip Johnson, I believe, was the guy who was who was the the um, architect kind of in charge of the Seagram's building, um, and he they uh, commissioned Rothko to do a set of panels for the the um, Four Seasons um, restaurant that was going to be. In in the you know upper areas of the of the building, and the idea was that he would do these panels that surrounded the entire um, um, area dining area, and so these people would be inside this giant cycle of paintings, and these were enormous paintings. I mean, some of them measuring you know fifteen feet, sixteen feet tall. Um, Rothko was a very thoughtful man and somebody who was very much um, uh, believed that these pieces should be accessible to all people, that this experience of art is something that should be communicating to humans on all levels and and so the idea that his his set of panels would be in this exclusive restaurant um was something which was rather dubious from the start um he made sure in the contract that that if for whatever reason he decided that this was not something that was that was um, uh, measuring up to how he wanted to see it happen, he retained the the uh, possession of the paintings. They were his. So. Um, Rothko, in the process of developing these paintings, took a trip to Europe, and um, oh, wait a minute, there we go. Went to Florence and and went to um, uh, San Marco, the 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 monastery in Florence where the Frau Angelicas are inside. Each one of these monks' cells is a little, these little murals are painted. And when you go inside there, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Florence, but if you go inside these little cells, they're, they're tiny. They're maybe eight by 10 feet or eight by 12 feet at most. And you go inside there and these magnificent little paintings are in there, these frescoes. And they're just gorgeous and you, your experience of being in this quiet space with these pieces is something that really impressed Rothko. And he really, he really loved that, that intimacy that you had with these, with these paintings. On the other hand, he went to see the Michelangelo uh, library in Florence and saw this great, um, structure, this, um, uh, they're imposing, they're, they're claustrophobic. You're inside this giant two-story thing and you're, you're facing against these, these frames that are window-like structures throughout, throughout the whole thing. Um, so both of these things converge, that sense of intimacy and that sense of, 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 being enclosed, um, both worked on Rothko at that time. And these are three more of the panels from the Seagram's um, um, mural commission. Um, so 
Rothko continued work on, on this set of, of, of paintings. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head how many of them there are in that, in that grouping, but there are a lot of them. And um, what happened was when, they, when he and his wife got back from uh, Europe, they went and ate at the, the, uh, the Four Seasons. And he looked at the people that were there. He looked at the situation and, and um, yeah, yeah, okay. There was a question that came up, which is, which is really an important point and thank you for raising it. The, yes, the experience of being in front of these paintings, of being in the presence of these paintings, these large scale, amazing pieces is very different from looking at these little postage stamps on screen. They resonate a lot differently when you're in person with them. And we have the opportunity to see some at the Neuberger Museum. There are some really spectacular ones in the collection of the museum, the Metropolitan Museum. Of course, the Museum of Modern Art has some good ones too. And when they're on view, uh, the Whitney has some good ones. But if you want a good display of them, DC, the um, the National Gallery has, has a gallery that is full of them. And that's, that's pretty much always something up. They have over a thousand Rothkos in their collection. Um, and if you do get to DC, you can also go to the Phillips, which also has a chapel, which was created for that location. So there are a number of different uh, spots for you to go and, and, and visit and be with the actual paintings. So yes, that's a really good point. And I meant to make that right at the beginning. These paintings are impossible to see digitally. <laughs> this is, a, this is a, an interesting talk to what your appetite for actually experiencing the paintings. So anyway, Rothko had been given a $35,000 um, uh, uh, commission to do these paintings. He gave the money back to, to um, the Seagram's company and kept the paintings and kept them until, until close to his death where he bequeathed them to the Tate Modern where they are now installed. And if you ever get to London, get there. <laughs> okay, and this is a set of frescoes that he saw when he was, when he was there. And this business of the Dionysian um, connectedness, the sense of merging, the sense of, of Dionys Dionysius is the god of wine. He's the god of merging, the god, this love, this, this boundlessness. But also, there's the, the other end of it. There's the, the sense of structure, the sense of, of, of containment. Both those things are playing off of each other in, in Rothko's work. This is the monumental uh, Rothko Chapel in Houston, and it looks like nothing here. We can't see any of what's really going on with this painting. I'll put it here. This way we can see a little bit. There's texture, there's color underneath that surface. There's the gesture of how that paint was applied. This is a, a wonderful late painting. Um, he, was, he was commissioned to do this piece, and Rothko loved Mozart. And this painting is really a Mozart requiem. It, underneath it all, there is that sense of, 
of tenderness, of yearning, of loss, of, of um, you know, there is, there is grief in this world and we carry it. And these paintings really address that in a very direct way. Uh, I've never been there, but, but I have seen some of his large scale lay pieces and he, he takes a deep dive. Now, Rothko was alcoholic. He had a heart attack um, and an aneurysm um, in 1967, I believe it was. And so he could no longer paint large scale pieces. He was, as I said, alcoholic. He was degenerating. His wife separated from him. They got a divorce. He moved into his studio. Um, Of late paintings right here, 1969. Uh, pretty depressive, and something that Rothko, you know, really struggled with uh, throughout his life was was depression, off and on. Um, these again, these are 1969, so it wasn't all dark. You know, there was, there was, he did some pastels, he did some exploring of different techniques and approaches. Um, so this is 1969, um, and he died in 1970. Um, he donated the, the, um, the Seagram's paintings to the Tate, and in 1970, they were shipped to the Tate and, and, and were taken, you know, actually were shipped and, and not displayed yet, but they were there in the hands of the Tate Modern. That donation was intact and they had the plans for how they were going to display them, which fit the specifics that Rothko wanted them to be seen, which is like one foot off the ground. And so that you can enter, so that a person can enter right into them. He would have had them slapped right down against the ground, but the custodial staff would not have put up with that. So when you, when and if you do get to London to the Tate, see these, these are displayed the way Rothko wanted those things displayed. Okay, these pieces are some late, you know, works on paper, and this is actually what the, mostly what this show in, in Washington, D.C. is going to be focused on. Um, okay, these are some of the people who were, were around Rothko, were influenced by Rothko, indebted to him. Um, um, uh, and you know, you see, you see the Milton Avery Dune piece. You see the Wolf Khan. Wolf talked about Rothko all the time and said, you know, I, you know, I try and pull Rothko into my landscapes. Um, you know, the color field painters, for me, do not have the depth and resonance of of Rothko, beautiful paintings though they are, they, they don't have the, the, the soul power that these Rothkos contain. Okay, and so Rothko um, uh, works on paper is gonna be November uh, 2023 through March, 2024. Um, I've got some listings of, of you know, uh, Rothko artist reality. If you put that into YouTube, you'll, you'll come up with a, with a pretty good talk. That's from the MFA. Um, Quiet Dominance of Form is a lecture by Christopher Rothko. There are at least four, if not five talks by Christopher Rothko about his father's work. Um, quite profound. Uh, Simon Shama did, did a, a talk on Rothko also, which is well worth looking at. Um, oh, any comments on, Ra on Albers? Well, Albers, Albers is a different matter. Albers is a wonderful 
um, uh, sense sense of color relationships, and and I love I love Albert's work. Contextualized color is quite remarkable and does its own thing. Very different what he's after from what from what uh, Rothko is after as far as soul is concerned. Um, so I I just feel that that um, there's a there's a kind of hovering um, what's that word numius uh, presence in the Rothko paintings. There's a kind of mythological stature in Albers that I love, but they but they are not about they are not about this 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 human contact directly. They're a very different kind of approach. Nonetheless, beautiful. So if there are any other questions, let me know. Um, uh, we are not going to be meeting for the next few weeks. Uh, I think the next, the next uh, one is going to be on the June 11th. Um, and I want to invite all of you, we are having our open studios here in Peak Skills. So if you're interested in coming to see my work, and I've been yakking away at you guys for the last couple of years, so some of you may be curious to see what I do. Um, I, I want to extend an invitation to all of you to come. Open Studios and Peak Skill is going to be taking place on June 4th and 5th between 12 and 5. Um, if you arrive a little late, I'll still have my studio door open. Um, and if you need information about that, you can go to the Peak Skill Arts Alliance website, and that'll that'll um, give you some information about that. Um, we are going to be doing a jazz series in person in July, but we'll talk more about that when we get a little closer to all of that. Um, so. Um, I think that's about it for this week. Thank you all for coming and um, hope to see you.